The calculus of probabilities when confined within just limits or to interest in an equal degree. The mathematician, the experimentalist, and the statesman. Le podcast interplanétaire. L'exploration de l'espace pour le bénéfice de toute l'humanité. Vos hôtes en Angleterre et en Norvège. Mathieu Russell et Chris Carney. Dude it. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh yeah baby, baby. Francois, Francois Arago. Arago. <laughs> oh. Oh, man. Hi Chris. Hi Matt. So who's got the best French accent? What do you think? You'll find out when I edit it together. I might do a little sort of hybrid of the two. Yeah, it's it's an ongoing thing for me. I once went to an audition for uh, Brian Jakes's Red Wall books to do the audio books, and if I'd have got them, it would have been a big payer as well because a few of my friends got on it and they 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 earned a bomb from it over the years. Uh, but then, the, so the first accent they asked me to do was uh, was Spanish, um, and it came came out Jamaican. Um, the next accent that they asked me to do was French, and that came out Jamaican. Oh, oh. And then the third accent they asked me to do was French Algerian, and I just said, "I'll have a good day," and <laughs> picked up my coat and left. <laughs> oh wow! F- French Algerian. Imagine oh, springing that on somebody in an audition. Uh, can you do French oh, yeah, Algerian? Just, you know French Algerian. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll do that. <laughs> it's just French with a wow. twang of Algerian. <laughs> Yeah, that. Yeah, that. You kind of. It's very specific, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you a question, Chris. Have you ever heard of Francois Arago? I I confess that I have not heard of this beautiful man. Yeah. Do you know what? So he died uh, on this day, the second of October, 1853. Mm-hmm. He was the only person I could find of any note on 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 the second of October uh, to do with space. But it turns out he's an absolute legend. I can't believe I've not heard of him. No way. Yeah, so get this. He was doing physics and noticed that um, things moved, like bits of copper moved about uh, moved about in a magnetic field, mm-hmm. i.e. this was pre-Faraday's, so he kind of, he was onto the electric motor. Yeah. Then he invented the polarization filter, which of course for astronomy is unbelievably important. They could be really good for social media right now as well, couldn't it? If only, oh, if only there was a polarization filter on social media, that would be very good. <laughs> it basically would be, there, there would just be a blank screen. <laughs> yeah, no one so, there. So, <laughs> no one there. Uh, they, so, uh, yeah, he's the first to use a polarization filter on a comet. Did He put together an experiment to show how the speed of light changed as it went through different mediums. So he talks about the speed of light last week. I don't know if you spotted Julio yeah, yes, and I talking yes, about that. Yes, absolutely did. It was a wonderful podcast. Why, why thank you, Chris. Um, <laughs> you're just staying that to stay on. Yeah, I was. Uh- <laughs> So he, he he made this experiment but never got round to doing it because of the French Revolution and then he went blind as well, which didn't help. Oh, my so, God. That's just double whammy of that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, So, but, but, he, but he did get to live to see that someone did do his experiment and prove that light goes at different speeds through glass, water, and air and things like that. But he didn't see it experiment. per se. He didn't see it, but he heard about it. Yeah, and then, um, and then he was the first person apparently to work out what the aurora borealis actually is—the <gasps> wonder of the north. Yeah, he he realised that it had something to do with uh, the magnetic fields and all that kind of stuff, and uh, and ionisation in the clouds. So that was pretty cool. That's mad. And he was mates with uh, Fresnel person who's most famous for for lighting and and his theories on optics and and so the, uh, yeah Francois Arago was a genius of optics too it's a cruel a cruel irony that he went blind i think i know isn't that yeah that is pretty awful isn't it yeah but uh yeah he was the french president at one point as well no way. if only they made <laughs> politicians like that <laughs> these days unbelievable <laughs> like after all of that, and I've still not heard of him. The mad thing is like that, you know, when he's working out how Aurora Borealis works at 1786 to 1853, maybe in the sort of 1800s, that was still when everyone else was like, God is angry. You know, like, it, it's like, that, that's incredible. Very oddly, he was an atheist as well. 
So it's uh, that that's pretty odd for that time. But yeah, an atheist, uh, an atheist French atheist. president Incredible. and a supporter of the uh, Carbonari. Oh, my favourite spaghetti. It's my favourite spaghetti sauce. Though. <laughs> well, yeah, it's actually an Italian revolutionary group called the Carbonari, which really? I'd never heard of as well until I read read about Francois Arago. The Carbonari were just like, we will put cream in the sauce. <laughs> uh, so, bon mort anniversaire uh, pour le Francois Arago. Absolutely, absolutely, mon. The last time we were together, Chris, we That's were right. talking about. Venus. Mm. You heard me right. Venus. Yes. <laughs> and uh, we're talking about how life was in the life was in the clouds. Yeah. But of course, Mars, being utterly childish, wanted to wanted to reclaim this um the limelight and say, hang on a second, I'm the life I'm the life bearing planet around here, chum. Typical Mars male, you know, kicking up a stink about the women taking a lion light at Venus. Podcast ninety one. Cast me mind back. Cast your mind back to Ooh, yes. uh, 91. Salad days. <laughs> uh, we talked. We talked about Issa's Mars Express had detected liquid water, yummy, hidden under the planet's south pole. Not just a small amount of it, but a great big, massive lake. Ooh. So there's yeah, uh, there's an instrument on Mars Express which is really cool. It's it's called Marsis, which is this radar that can penetrate below the ground and it's got this enormous radio mast that that unfurls and they use similar things in planes flying over over glaciers looking for underground lakes and under glacial lakes um so yeah it's 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 been surveying mars now for a long time and this first batch of data that they were using 29 observations using Marsis 2012 to 2015 they found what they thought was a, a subglacial lake mhm uh 1.5 kilometers below the surface so not a trivial distance below no. and 20 kilometers wide that's 12 miles wide so a pretty big lake and and that was no that is the first ever stable body of water ever found on Mars. There was a, quite a few people saying, you know, it, it could be anything that you're seeing. It could be a, a a volcano underneath the ice, for example. Yeah. So the team, an Italian team, um, led by uh, Sebastian Emanuel Loro and Elena Petananelli. Oh, I love them. Roma tre a university. They took a few more uh, uh, raid, radar profiles, 134 to be precise, between 2010 and 2019. So I'm assuming it included the original set, but some before and obviously some after. And uh, yeah, they've confirmed this lake and also three small, at least three smaller lakes around it. But not only that, they've corrected the size of the lake to be even bigger, so 19 miles wide, and then a, a few smaller lakes, all of them a few kilometres across. Cool is that? There's loads of lakes on Mars. I mean, that's incredible. But, I mean, and, you know, what we're what we're saying here, isn't it, is wherever there's water, we generally believe there to be life. Water's definitely really useful. Yeah, but I'm going to I'm going to get in I'm going to get into this because yeah the, the paper is called multiple subglacial water bodies below the south pole of Mars unveiled by new Marsis data catchy catchy it is catchy uh, it, it is pretty much a cupronal of headlines it, it's doing exactly what it says on the tin it's a funding attractor uh, I'd say well they've already got the funding so so yeah they've they've used this these new signal processing techniques. Very similar to the ones that they use over the these subglacial lakes in Canada and Greenland. So that's that's where they've been trying out these techniques. And of course, you can prove those ones are there because they're on Earth, and it's it's a lot easier to kind of verify your results. And then they've used the similar sort of techniques out at Mars. This part of of Mars is known as Ultimi Scopuli. So the, the Italians definitely got in there first, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, they certainly did. The Italians have got a bit of a rich heritage for the old Mars, what with Schiaparelli and people like that. 
Good old Italians. Yeah, well, the Romans used to believe, you know, it was one of their main gods and that, so they do have a bit of a claim to it. The old uh, Romans came from Italy, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah, they were all from there, you know. Yeah. So, but here's the rub. Here's the rub is yeah. that when when you've got water that's been sort of still for a while, just sitting in a great big rocky hole, hmm. it tends to kind of absorb um, a lot of the minerals and salts around it until it gets to almost being completely saturated with with the salts that are there. So the one thing that they can't work out, of course, is why this why these lakes aren't frozen. So the one thing that this radar does, it it, it finds it very difficult to tell the difference between rock and ice. Right. But it it tells the difference between rock and water very, very easily. So if it's liquid water, then it shows up lots more than if it's ice. So they they're they're convinced that this is water. That it's actually li- it's in liquid form, but of course it's very very cold, so it should be frozen. Mm. But what they think is that it's very very saline, so it's it's hyper saline in fact. Um, but unlike it, it it probably isn't like table salt, like the stuff that you stick on your fish and chips, etc. Yeah, it's probably um, these magnesium and calcium perchlorates which are actually used in rocket fuel, bizarrely. So the Italians make make this stuff for the uh, European launchers, like the Vega rocket actually has a great big mixing bowl full of perchlorates that they burn to get this to get uh, Vega up in the air. And uh, but that's that's beside the point. Mars is covered in this stuff. The perchlorates are everywhere, and they're 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 not very nice. They're quite, in fact, they're quite horrible. Hmm. It's chlorine bound to four oxygens, which is why it's such a good oxidizer and and um, solid rocket propellant. Um, but it's also a really good de-icer. So oh. it would, it, 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 yeah. So it 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 would keep the water very liquid, even down to very very cold temperatures like minus one hundred and twenty degrees C. So it it's it that's pretty handy, isn't it? Well, that could be great for so, we could yeah. actually mine that and you know, start a really good de-icer business, you know, for for cars and whatnot. Like, I mean, just to that, just an idea. If the Italians are wondering what they're going to do with this stuff, it could actually make a bomb because, you know, de-icer is not cheap. No, particularly, I'd imagine that de-icer goes for a premium up in Norway. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's essential. So, you know, I've got the contacts here, you know, so let's see, let's see how we get on. <laughs> Do you remember the time when a wine manufacturer at, was adding de-icer to wine to make it taste nicer and they and they no. got caught out? Yeah, no, that was a time. I'm going to have to look that story up, but yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty weird. Yes, de-icer it, ends up all over the shop. Was it's it not, Blue Nun? Not... <laughs> I don't think it was Blue Nun, but, but I think it might have been German wine, though. I think it oh. might have been, but I can't remember. Let, let's not um, besmirch any wine manufacturer. No, uh, Blue Nun is sure a if... very, very fine, quaffable wine, despite the de-icer. Yes, and, <laughs> <laughs> despite the de-icer. Yeah, how weird. Imagine, imagine being the person uh, like at the wine place. Oh, yeah, it's, it doesn't taste quite right. Well, why don't we try a little bit of de-icer? In? Oh, my God, that really works. <laughs> Isn't it poisonous? <laughs> yeah, but don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so weird. So I've always thought that just very bizarre. But uh, here's 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 a question for you. Go so on. when is something? <laughs> I love I love this that there's a scale that's like this. So you have fresh water, yeah, brackish water, Ooh. saline water, mm. and brine. Oh, brine. So they they're actually they're actually defined. These are yeah. So, like, so fresh water, you, it, it's got to have less than 0.05% salt in it, right? And then it's right. fresh. Yeah. Then it becomes brackish if it's anything between that and 3%. Then it becomes saline if it's 3% to 5%. And then it becomes brine when it's 5% to 26%. And then it becomes hypersaline over 35%. And that's like your proper, like, it's just so thick you can barely wade through it, I would imagine. Well, you you can, no, I mean, it's still liquidy water, but you can float in it. 
Well, that's right. the really cool thing is that, that when you go to you, when you go to these hypersaline lakes, because there's loads of these really big hypersaline lakes. There's obviously Salt Lake City, for example, is on is on a salt lake, on a hypersaline salt lake. The Great big, Salt big Lake. Big up to the Mormons. Yeah. Yeah, that that is that can get to twenty seven percent salinity, which would make it yeah, which which does make it actually mesosaline, according to another scale that I found. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, in fact, a lot of these are mesosaline rather than hypersaline. That has to be greater than fifty percent, which I don't think any of these lakes actually are. But the most saline lake on Earth is Gudule Pond. Which has a salinity of forty three percent, and that's in Ethiopia. God cool, blimey! You know, if it's not hard enough, if it's not hard enough to find fresh water in Ethiopia, and they, they, they've got a lake, that's yeah, just and then they've got really, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But but a lot of these lakes, of they're, they're really not only are they really salty, they they also the salts often add lot, a, a real bright colour to them. So, but you can get you. Can, there's another there's another type of salty lake that you get soda lakes. Have you ever heard of them? Soda lake, like soda stream. Soda lakes, yeah, like so you like soda stream, yeah. Where they where the where the where the salts are made of car, of sodium carbonates instead of sodium chlorides, and and like washing soda. And in in actual fact, those lakes are full of cyanobacteria and things like that, and they're the things that make flamingos go pink. Ah, like ah. Lake Nakuru. Bicarbonate of soda could be really good for getting red wine out of stuff, the ice or not. Exactly. So maybe that's what people have been doing. They've been washing the clothes in that lake, and the, those flamingos were white, but they've ultimately turned pink, like most of the washing I do. <laughs> yeah, they've just gone in the wash. <laughs> but. <laughs> The reason the reason why I bring all these lakes up is because obviously we've got loads and loads of these hypersaline lakes on Earth, like in Siberia and places like that. So there, there's there's some really really cool ones. Um, the it's so in the Arctic, the Canadian Devon Ice Cap contained two huge subglacial lakes that are hyper hypersaline. Dead Sea is another one as well. I'd love Massive. to go there. Like all, all jokes aside, I genuinely would love to float in a salty lake. I think it'd be amazing. Yeah, I wonder what our nearest uh, floaty, floaty, salty lake is. Right in. I don't, they don't know how salty these lakes are, but it's highly likely that that it's perchlorates rather than chlorides that are and, and soda lakes and things like that. So it's more likely it's like that. But in all these lakes and all these different salty lakes, in soda lakes and in salty lakes, and and maybe even as I'll get onto, because I found another another paper. But yeah, you you have these things called halo files. Have you ever heard of that? I've A never heard of file. halo files, but um, I, I I think it might have something to do with uh, with like a halo around your around your head, sort of thing. Is is that is the way they look? Maybe or for uh, the Greek for salt is halo. So a halo file literally is salt loving, salt loving. So yeah, halo file, yeah, salt loving, brilliant. Yeah, halo file. They're obviously all sort of you know extremophiles. These halo files, they 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 live in absolutely extreme conditions, and they're mostly archaea, which are a kind of single cell pre bacterial single cell life form. Um, But then there are some halo files that are bacterial. And there's even eukaryotes that are that are not obviously not complex ones like chimps, but more like algae and fungus that are also um, halophiles. I don't know. I had a pet chimp and he was pretty simple. I've got to say, <laughs> he couldn't do anything. <laughs> he couldn't do anything. Very very quick at, at, at pointing at numbers. That's what they're good at. Yeah, and shapes. They're really, they're really fast, really good. Uh, no chimps are ace. I'd love a pet chimp oh, until yeah. it ripped my face off. But the <laughs> the there's 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 three. There's at least three independent roots that these halophiles have evolved. So obviously, you know that it's 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 something that's feasible, and there's lots of different ways that life can can adapt to to cope with these really really salty 
conditions. And the main problem with salty conditions is this thing called osmosis. So, you know, this balance between the fluid inside the cell and outside of the cell. And obviously, things like salt basically make your cells explode, um, essentially. Yeah, it's one of the few out. things I so, remember from science lessons was osmosis. Like so, yeah, yeah. so... <laughs> So it's this osmotic balance. And and obviously these these different halophiles have got different ways around um get, getting around, getting around this the, you know, this 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 terrible <laughs> salt effect of you know, this osmosis effect. Yeah. Um and there's even, yes, art artemia, which is a type of um halophilic crustacean that lives in salt lakes so Mm. you know these crabs that have adapted to have salt glands you know these unique salt glands and get this even the scottish are in on it you know how the scottish like their extreme diets like deep fat fried mars bars and stuff like that deep fried jimmy cranky (laughs) deep fat fried jimmy cranky the the north Ronald's Day sheep from the Orkney Islands in Scotland, the most extreme of the Scottish, I would say, the Orkney yeah. Scottish. Yeah. Um, the they eat salty seaweed, and if any other sheep tried to live off it, it would die. So right. yeah, he, so that's an example of a very complicated animal uh, adapting to a ridiculously salty environment. Not that I'm suggesting that there's sheep on Mars. I think that, that is probably. I think that'd be amazing. I think far. it'd be brilliant if, if they just turned out that there's Scottish people on Mars, like <laughs> tossing the cave. So anyway, yeah. sorry, so, Scottish people. I didn't mean to stereotype you with tossing the cave, but that was awful. <laughs> but the 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 relevant thing to Mars, though, is that there there isn't any oxygen, so you can't have life that's an aerobe. Spelled mm. A-E-R-O-B-E. So you can't mm. have aerobes. Um, what you want is autotrophic life so that they make their own food and, and then make their own energy for inorganic compounds. That's called chemolithotrophic, yes. which is a pretty cool phrase. And then you also want them to probably be psychotolerant, withstand very cold conditions, and they're probably going to be methanogens or methanogens. There's the clue. They're meth- they, they breathe out methane. It's very interesting with the methane thing because it seems like every time we're looking at the possibilities of life elsewhere, it's, methane seems to be popping up quite a lot. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Methane is one of these biosignature gases. See, this, this is the thing on Mars. Obviously, they picked up this seasonal methane uh, increases and and th- and there is a mystery around yeah these big methane increases around Mars uh, and obviously it's highly likely just in 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 the case of Venus as well it's highly likely that there's some chemical or geological uh, activity that's creating it rather than a biological activity but we do know that bio- biology certain types of biology create methane particularly in methanogens, these types of bacteria. So there is a paper from 2015 that I found called The Effects of Perchlorates on the Permafrost Methanogens and the Mm. Implication for Autotrophic Life on Mars. So this is by Victoria Shkerbakova. Victoria Shkerbakova. Shkerbakova. Victoria Shkerbakova. It does. This looks at exactly this. This um, they isolated and described four strains, methanogenic archaea of the methanobacterium and methanoarchaea genera from samples of Pliocene and Holocene permafrost from eastern Siberia. So many words. So many. So many words. words. And so they uh, they studied the effect of sodium and magnesium perchlorates on the growth of permafrost and non-permafrost methanogens and present evidence that permafrost hyd- hydrogenotrophic methanogens are more resistant the, to the chaotropic agent found in Martian soil. So in other words, ah. uh, these these sort of cold permafrost living methanogens are actually resistant to the poisonous effects of the these of the perchlorates that you would find in the martian soil 
<laughs> and, and that's really, really, that's really, really interesting. So that that paper is a really what they what they're trying to do is is to understand the sort of uh, chemical pathways that you could expect life to possibly have if they're surviving in this in these sort of watery, icy parts of Mars. But maybe even, you know, maybe the fact that this one is talking all about ice and we don't even need to have to go that far because this is water, so it may even be easier than this lot we're thinking. I'm, I'm thinking, like, with, with Venus, uh, the news of Venus and, and what we've already learned about Mars, I think it's really... I mean, we, we, we already know to some extent that life is is very very probable but like that it's it looks like it's like within i reckon within a decade it's just something that we will know and accept i'm so with arthur c clark I, I genuinely think one of the best things he's ever said is that that whole idea of if we're alone in the universe it's incredible like we're just ridiculous and if we <laughs> if we're not alone in the universe it's also ridiculous that both outcomes are just as frightening. Yeah, <laughs> they're just—it's yeah. just—they're both <laughs> mind. So we should be—we should be in a permanent state of being mind blown, right? Yeah, completely. But I, oh, I mean, that's just yeah. the, the, the implications, really, and you know, uh, maybe faith implications for people. Uh, you know, even if it is just bacteria, what it eventually does is point towards the fact that there is something surviving elsewhere and then that must be abundant in the universe. And that's, mm. yeah, absolutely mind-blowing stuff. The other thing is incredible is just the diversity of life on this planet and all the different sort of paths. And it's like any nook and cranny that you look, life has somehow found a way to to sort of to take hold, like even inside nuclear reactors and stuff like that. You know, there's there's life living <laughs> living in like ex- off the radiation that's sort of left behind and stuff. You know what? I love a tardigrade. Abs- I'm, a, I'm a big fan of a tardigrade. They are absolutely genius. There's no two ways about it. Uh, my favourite name for them is the moss piglet, by the way. That's what I love. I love that. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's moss really piglet. <laughs> moss piglet, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like it, but yeah. Sometimes, the, the, obviously, the, they're sometimes known as water bears, but I think moss piglet yeah. is my favourite. But the the beauty of it is, I think it was in in Cosmos where it says, you know, if 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 aliens were to visit Earth, then depending on the, their size, depending on what what size these aliens were, they would actually think that the Earth belongs to the tardigrade. It always ends up somehow helping us make some food. So, like, halophiles are involved in things like soy sauce and and um, fermented beans and salted cod and things like that, and sauerkraut oh. even. So, like, yeah, you, you need these halophiles to actually ferment salty foods. Yeah. It's just weird, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, but it's salt, salt is, it's like, so, so good. Salt is, is so necessary as well, isn't it? Like, you know, not in large quantities, of course, but we need it. Too much? You die. Too little, you die. Thanks. It's a a fine balance. Unless you're extremophile and you, and then it doesn't matter. As much salt as you want. Just drown, drown your fish and chips in it. No problem if you're extremophile. Do you know what? The tardigrade thing's interesting because I think there's lots of life that lives in in these um, sort of hypersaline lakes that when they completely dry out, when the life in it becomes completely desiccated, it can sort of remain that way for a few hundred years and then be brought back to life as soon as water lands back on the yeah. land again. <laughs> so unreal. You know, the thing is like... As soon as it rains, it's like, oh, I'm alive they're again. They're so hardy, hardy tardies, you know, like, they, they, for example, like like a tardigrade, you know, is that like, then we're talking about, you know, too too much one way or the other with salt and we die. And then <laughs> these other living things are just like, what do you got? <laughs> <laughs> Just give us it. I can survive. What do you got? Hey, what, what, do, you, what do, you do you got? Radiation, <laughs> complete dehydration. Yeah, whatever. I can, I can. Yeah, you know, you humans are terrified of stepping outside of a spacecraft, even when you've got a massive spacesuit on. I can go out there, and it's no, it's no a great laugh. shakes. Whatever. <laughs> it's a, in fact, yeah, I'm having a daft laugh on that. <laughs> Amazing, amazing. <laughs> Talking of Mars, there I I noticed in the Martian equivalent, there's a there's the Daily Ex, the Mars's Daily Express. Right. They were uh, printed a story about an asteroid the size of a sports car 
has just buzzed the red planet. Calling Elon. Yeah, and it turns out it, it wasn't just the size of a sports car. It was actually Elon Musk's um, Tesla. Right now, it's really close yeah. to Mars. So right now, if you track it on whereisroadster.com, you can see that it's actually very, very Interesting near Mars, thing about that, quite, though. I was wondering, cool. you, know, the, the, <clears throat> you know, how obviously uh, we have to be very careful about where things land in case there's a possibility of life, you know, places like Enceladus and stuff like that. What's mm. the – is there a course plotted with uh, with, with Elon's um, – Tesla is 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 it is it designed to stay away from those things or is there a check because you just said it could have crashed into Mars I mean what if it was to crash into one of our you know one of our possible lifey places like uh you know is, is it going to go that far no it's not so it's 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 in a sort of Mars type or uh, orbit around the sun but sort of so a bit of a bit of the orbit is taking it out as far as Mars it's qu- quite an elliptic orbit but yeah, I mean, it, it's they didn't really plan exactly where the Tesla's going to end up, and of course now it's out and it's beyond this kind of two or three body problem. Hmm. <laughs> it's very very hard to work out exactly what's going to happen to it because it, it could come crashing back through the Earth's atmosphere at, at some point in the future, or it might crash on Mars, or it might hit Phobos. Yeah. You never know, but yeah, no, it's it's going to go nowhere near Enceladus or Europa or Venus or any of these places. But, but yeah, it could, it could potentially hit Mars. But but this is the thing: like the solar system is so, so hmm. massive and so barren. These are like little tiny specks of dust in orbit around a tennis ball on a playing field that's thirty miles. <laughs> I've across. seen that as well. Yeah, it's like, That's what's crazy. the chances of hitting it? <laughs> so it's like you know, it's it's like it's not very likely mm, to happen. True, true. But yeah, I I want to know exactly if if we'd had a camera on on the Tesla, and it could and it we had an antenna on the Tesla as well. What kind of photos Starman could be taking right now and beaming mm. back to us? Hmm. Absolutely. I mean, do, do they do they are they still monitoring that? They must be, surely, or is it just off? Well, no, because I, I, it's it's while it was still visible, they plotted its cause and course, but I don't think, yeah, that it's being you know it's being tracked anymore because it's too small an object. I think they know the sort of life cycle of the PR of it as well. <laughs> no, no one's actually paying to try and track the oh. thing either. <laughs> It's just a, it's just a piece of space yeah, junk, completely posh bit of space that, junk that's been forgotten about. <laughs> In fact, yeah, there was there was talk of a, a Earth having another moon as well, wasn't there? And that was all to do with a piece of space junk coming back, and that's probably yeah. what it is. It's some Japanese rocket casing. Yeah. Well, you know, there might still be one there, just oh, okay. you know, very small. I don't know, button moon. That's quite small. Mm. So you know, I, I watched that when I was a kid and. <laughs> you know, I, I still believe it's out there with Mr. Spoon. Oh, yeah, I love the I love the theme music to that. We're good, after Button Moon. We'll follow Mr. Spoon. Button, Button Moon. Moon. Button oh, so Moon. That was it. Most of our international listeners will have no idea what the hell you were talking about, but they should. Hey, they should go on YouTube. YouTube. Go on your job. <laughs> Do you want to have a listen to the my interview with David Whitehouse? Oh, do I? I'd love to. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I've got two books to mention here because they're, they're both out and I've got interviews with both David Whitehouse and with uh, Katia Moskvich. Mm-hmm. Katia Moskvich has written one called Neutron Stars, The Quest to Understand the Zombies of the Cosmos. And that is, that's that's been Oof. out for a week now and it's absolutely brilliant. I really, really, really like my chat with Cathy as well. She's a, a brilliant journalist as well, as is David. So a couple of books I'm trying to make my way through while at the same time working really hard. Um, but they're both brilliant books. I, the Neutron Star one is absolutely epic if you're i mean writing a whole book about neutron stars and, and the kind of all the people behind it etc etc so an interview next week that's with katia and then this one this week is david whitehouse whose book's been out for a while now and i've been making my way through and it's absolutely genius it's called space 2069 in other words 100 years after the apollo landings and it's yeah. and it's his yeah. view because he david whitehouse wrote one of the best books i thought about 
the uh, the Apollo 11 celebrations, 50 years. So his next book is another 50 years beyond that with all his experience over the last you know, ages of space journalism and and looking into it. Doctor David Whitehouse, um, mm. who got his got his PhD from Jodrell Bank, I believe. So he knows what he's talking oh, about. He knows brilliant. what he's yeah. talking about, and he's got uh, up to date up to date science. And uh, yeah, I, and I really enjoyed this chat. So do you want to do you want to do you want to have a quickie listen to it? Please play it for us. A coup tie. The interplanetary. Podcast, putting the ace back into space. Right, so we're joined again on the podcast by David Whitehouse because you've got yet another book, but I, I think it's a sequel. Is is that sort of a sequel? Is that right, David? Welcome to the show. Hello there. Yes, it actually it is. You're very perceptive to think of it as a sequel because when uh, the last book, Apollo 11, came out last year for the anniversary, uh, obviously, and... Um, after that, after a few months of that going, being on sale, two months or so, uh, the publishers said, well, what are you going to write next? Uh, and what publishers often want is another one that's the same but different of the book that sold before, you see. So so I, I knew what they would like. And I thought, well, it is a sequel because Apollo 11 was 50 years after the anniversary. And I thought, okay, let's go 100 years after the anniversary and uh, have fun if you like, looking forward from now, but also plonking yourself at various times in that 50 years and looking back and looking around. So I thought this was a nice book that um, you could ha- you could have great fun with, not only in terms of the missions and, and a bit of speculation, but also a little bit of fiction. You know, what's it like to stand on Mars? What's it like to, to be at the moon base? And so consequently, I, I set off on that. And it turned out to be, as most books do, more complicated than, than I, I, I thought. But in the end, I think it's I think it's an interesting book. Yeah, what 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 take us through it? So it's it's a it's set a, is it set a hundred years after the Apollo eleven landing? So fifty years from sort of fifty years from now. Yeah, well, well, that's the limit of the book. I don't, I, I, I speculate a little bit about what's beyond that, but that's the main focus of the book. So, it, it's set now and at various stages. Like, for instance, the, you know, the opening of the book is is really important because I think it's after page two readers decide whether they're going to carry on reading it or <laughs> going to put it down. So the, you've got to you've got to get the first page or two right. And so I, I set the first page or two in twenty sixty nine. Mm. at the 100th anniversary of Apollo 11, when there are celebrations on the Moon and Mars, uh, and also back on Earth, particularly at Neil Armstrong's birthplace. So I then try and sort of set the scene of where we are in 2069, or where I hope we'll be, uh, and then sort of back fill the backstory in. And basically the, the book is, um, the beginning of the book is building the Moon base, then it's building, going to Mars and building the base on Mars. And the rest, and there's a lot of other bits about the other bits of the exploration we could do. But basically it is back to the moon and on to Mars. And and for the next 10 years, um, I concentrated on, on the moon because that's when I think that hopefully we'll be going back. And hopefully in 10 years' time, we'll have a semi-permanent moon base. Well, I've often noticed that when people start to try and predict the future it's always wildly out i mean you mentioned arthur c clark in your in the in the preface to the book i've, I've noticed yeah. and of course he'd be insanely disappointed by where we're at now in 2020 oh, in 2020 <laughs> that's right i mean we're in you know, 2001 we're at jupiter mm. or in the book um saturn mm. um and of course we're nowhere near did you set off with some intrepidation in terms of trying to work out the timeline, because it seems that that we've been wildly optimistic about yeah. about space and and how far human exploration can go. I actually think I think we've done a really good job with, with things like robotic exploration. We we've probably gone further than we thought we would. But in terms of human exploration, that's been <laughs> one of the biggest disappointments ever. So so yeah. w- what makes the next say fifty years different? Well, of course, it could be the same. You know, we could, in 50 years' time, we could be still orbiting the Earth, or possibly going to the moon, but have travelled no further. Uh, and I hope, but I hope that's not the case. I hope that we're actually going to do something. And this is where the fickle finger of fate has pointed at Donald Trump. 
<laughs> Believe it or not, Donald Trump might actually turn out to be a good space president. Uh, you, his, his performance in other fields is, is you know, <laughs> a, you know, it's, it's debatable. But in terms of space, over the years there've been good and bad space presidents. And when Trump came along and NASA said we plan to put people back on the moon by 2028, um, I think he saw um, here in his team saw a, um, uh, something that could be used. Uh, if it was 2024, if they told NASA to get a move on, then perhaps it could be part of Trump's second term. Um, now, it probably won't be, but NASA still seems to be sticking to that timeline. And although Congress has questioned the budget, it's still on at the moment for 2024. I mean, uh, but the interesting thing about landing on, on, on the moon in 2024 is that the steps are now visible. The mm. problem with the three or four times in the past when uh, America decided it was going back to the moon is that the end step wasn't visible from the start. You, you, the technology, the, the mission plan was, was to be evaluated, was to be developed. And what happened with that is that lots of money was available at first, and then the next year Congress said, well, do you need all that money? You know, we take a bit off the top, and then the timetable for that project was extended. Uh, and then that happened again. And in the end, like the Constellation program that uh, Bush uh, Jr. launched to go back to the moon, um, there wasn't enough money being spent on it, and the goal was too far in the future, and everybody gave up. That doesn't seem to be happening at the moment. You know, we've got three major missions leading up to a landing, and you can see those, and you can see the hardware uh, coming together. So it may be cancelled. It may run out of money. The timetable may slip. But I get the impression that now something is happening, whereas in the past you never never got the feeling that it would end up with boots on the moon. No, no I know I agree. I'm, I'm, I actually made this exact same point that Trump, with with all his <laughs> all his <laughs> downside, yeah, by just sticking a, a, a completely almost a, what everyone said was an unrealistic timeline, and and I think if if everyone's honest, it is still unrealistic to be on the moon. By 2024, there's there's too many things that would have to go right perfectly all the way for that to happen. But but it, hey, it, might, it still might. Um, but it it has. It's like there, there's no two ways about it. We, we all these contracts are being made, and it there's there's an actual program in place, isn't there? That's right. And you know, yes, it does seem outlandish, and and it may slip. Uh, but then again, you look back at. America's great time in space in the 60s. And the progress they made there was not only incredible, outlandish and impossible by today's terms. You know, they got to the moon in a few years' time. You know, admittedly, they spent a, a lot more money. But today we've got better technology. We've got better materials. We've got better computing. We've got better simulation. We've got SpaceX launching its own capsules, which can be modified to go to the moon. So, so it's... It's there's not so much development as uh, as we needed back in the 1960s because obviously nobody then had ever done it before. So there are pros and cons for this, but it you know it sort of it feels as though it's 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 in our grasp. And then when somebody you know when somebody asks you are we going back to the moon, you don't just shrug your shoulders and say well you know ten years time perhaps not etc. We've had that for 50 years. Mm. You know I do feel that. We might just do it in the next four, five, or six years' time. Yeah. So, do, does does the book deal with the threads in terms of? Well, there's a few th threads that I think are going at the moment, and that yeah. is this shift to commercial space, but also the shift to other space powers. As far as I can see, Russia are a kind of now really drifting out of things whereas yeah, china, right, whereas right. china is is clearly on the ascendancy so uh, how, how does the book deal with those themes of of for example like commercial space i always think clearly there has to be a commercial reason for doing it although i know elon musk <laughs> it does it for sort of more outlandish <laughs> reasons than that but presumably he's still you know he still has to um make things work commercially so uh, how does the book deal with those kind of different threads? Well, I know I chucked a load at you there, but... Uh, that's all right. That's right. You, you've hit on a major theme because you're quite right. Russia 
Russia, looking looking at it, has been a declining space power since the early 1980s. In fact, you can look back to the late 70s when the Russian government abandoned space and let it free fall. Look at the example of Buran, mm. Snowstorm, the Russian copy of the space shuttle. That was a program which cost a great deal of money uh, to develop, but then was left adrift and, and only got into space, you know, very difficultly and very shortly. So... Um, and since then, they've been trading on their, their Soyuz capsule and their Proton and Soyuz rockets, um, which are good workhorses, but they've not been doing anything else. Um, and if they weren't partners on the International Space Station, they wouldn't have one of their own. So you're quite right. Russia is a declining space power and China is in the ascendancy. Uh, and also, and in a way, this brings back the 60s. In the 60s, you had Russia and America. In the decades to come, you might have America and China, because China clearly has intent to uh, have a major space program. And it's been very clever in letting its space program grow with its economy, um, so that as its economy becomes more dominant, as everybody expects it to be in the decades to come, its space program will naturally get bigger um, with the same percentage of spending. And um, so, yes, China. I mean, I remember, actually, um, attitudes to this um, a few years ago when Charlie Bolden was head of NASA, and he was testifying before, um, before I think it was the Senate, um, and he said he thought that given the rate, current rate of uh, American progress, that uh, the next people to land, land on the moon would be Chinese, and it didn't bother him. And I think it was the Honorable Member for Texas stood up and said, well, it sure as heck bothers me. And then things started to move and change and 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 there was you know because america owns the moon it thinks it, it you know it's, oh. it's it's moon and then things started to change and then trump eventually came in but china is going to be the great rival not only in terms of it wanting its own moon base which i think it will have by the 20, early 2030s and going on to mars and in between sending more probes to the planets but china and america are involved in a new phase of space militarization. You, you must have picked up over, mm. over the last few years the talk about space weapons and the talk about, well, the Space Force is, a, is an indication of that. And there's one story I tell in the book which, which I think sums up, a, sums up this. There was a, a communication satellite launched, I think, in the, in the 90s, which went into the wrong orbit. And uh, it went into a high orbit near the moon, what we call cislunar space. And everybody lost contact with it. Uh, it was too far away. Uh, but then its orbit brought it back closer to the Earth, and they found it again, and they were able to bring it back into a useful orbit. But everybody thought, hey, you can put a satellite, even if it's of malintent, even if it's a, um, a, a weapon, got a space weapon on it or a killer satellite, you can put it in low Earth orbit and everybody knows where it is. You stick it up in cislunar space and only you know where it is. So this idea of using the space around the moon for military purposes, to hide dark satellites, to squirrel away and hide your resources and your assets, which could be used in times of conflict, is, is quite a strong theme at the moment. And I think that the Space Force in America, whatever China calls its um, military space effort, are going to be a major theme over the next few decades, as, um, as, as perhaps we might even get into space conflict. It's, uh, it, that was a section of the book I found really fascinating because it was literally, it reminded me of Ronald Reagan's high ground. He wanted the high ground to be defended by Star Wars. Now the high ground has shifted further out to the moon. And that's a whole different ball game. Yeah, that that is interesting, isn't it? That must that there must be so many different scenarios. I mean, I I yeah. I'm always a little bit sympathetic to something like Space Force because I I look at just how many right very important assets are in space that that we as a sort of civilized yeah, yeah. <laughs> race on on Earth depend on now. You know, it it we it, it's if even with a you know a, a fairly minor skirmish of destroying a few communication satellites and a few other things assets in space we'd we'd be in all sorts of trouble <laughs> that's right i mean 
Reagan's um, Star Wars was designed to protect against uh, uh, a nuclear strike from Russia. But it was also being said at the time that it was to protect um, space assets. Now, in the 80s, we didn't have, we had only at the start of the internet, and we weren't nearly as reliant on space as we are now. It's, as you say, it's intertwined into our lives. It is absolutely everywhere. And if it, if it doesn't work well and it, if it goes away, you know, that's a major bit of our civilization. Can you imagine in a few years' time when we have as routine driverless cars? which uh, rely on satellite navigation. You know, interrupting that, you'd cripple an economy. Hmm. Well, I'd suggest that you'd, yeah, take away GPS right now and and <laughs> we'd yeah. cripple the economy even yes. now, presumably. Yes, that's right. So so China is, going, China is a theme. And when I write about going back to the moon, I have uh, the Americans, as their plans, uh, going to Shackleton Crater on the south pole of the moon, which is which is the polar regions of the moon are wonderful because they are lands of eternal shadows. And if you're standing on the moon's poles, you wouldn't see the sunrise or set. It would move across the horizon, uh, low on the horizon, and the shadows would move around you like the hands of a clock. And the earth would be in the same, roughly the same place. And so in the shadows, there is ice, and that ice can be used for the moon base. And America's going to Shackleton on the South Pole. And I thought, well... China is going to want a base, and it's not going to want it on the next, you know, the other side of Shackleton Crater. So I put them at the North Pole, where there is um, there's plenty of ice available, and there's plenty of interesting landing sites. So by the mid late 2030s, I have bases for the uh, Americans, uh, the start of tractor convoys exploring the South Polar region, and the Chinese in the north. Um, with an interesting north-south divide on the moon between China and America. And and also, because of the pa- pacing of, of, of what I think could happen, is that, well, there was a recent report out which said that even if America really got going now, it couldn't send a manned crewed mission to Mars before the late 2030s. So I have the era of the moon um, this decade and next decade when we are learning to use the ice on the moon to support a a moon base Uh, and also getting experience because there is ice on Mars that we can can use and the the technology is in common. But I don't have the first flights to Mars until 2040-ish. And there I play around with a bit of fiction because the thing I realised very early on is that we know about Mars. We know about the surface. We've been there. We know about the temperature, the pressure, and everything. What we don't know is the journey, mm. the journey and its effect on us. And to me, that's that's the big thing. How do we get to Mars functioning? The more I delve into this journey from Earth to Mars, yeah. that seems to be the, the just the hugest unknown. Yeah. That, that puts the kibosh on really any plan that says it's before 2040. I, I, I <laughs> you yeah, know, we just right. don't know anything about like the lack of gravity and and the and the radiation that you have to deal with and and just the sort of just well, the, what it must psychologically must be like to travel that far away from Earth. Yeah, all those things. Yes, they are. They are major obstacles. I mean, you read Scott Kelly's book, his biography mm. of uh, when he comes back from a year in space. The guy's a wreck. Yeah, it's you know, grim. There's some harrowing paragraphs in that book mm. of him coming to terms with, with gravity again and his legs swell up and they're bruised and he can't walk and he feels sick. Um, and that's due to a, a year in space. Can you imagine arriving at Mars in that condition and being expected to land on the planet? You yeah. Know, it's not going to work, <laughs> is it? No, and presumably it'll be worse as well because yeah. hey, it's longer. And radiation, I can't imagine, will make the effects of gravity less. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> we, we do not know what the sun can throw at us. Mm. And it's it's no good saying, well, the sun is going through solar minimum at the period, so we'll have a mar- an interplanetary transit when the sun is quiet because the big flares, the big radiation killers – don't obey the solar cycle. They can occur at almost any time. So, yes, you, going to Mars is, is medical, it, it's radiation, it's psychological. I mean, for instance, if you set off for Mars from Earth orbit, um, only after a couple of hours, when you've not even passed the moon, your abort options are zero. Mm. 
So you cannot come back. You're passing the moon. Uh, and if something goes wrong, you can't stop and turn around. Uh, you have to go on the full two and a half, three year voyage to Mars. Uh, and uh, this is why um, in my sort of imagined trip to Mars, the first mission is, um, is a flyby. Uh, to understand the voyage, just like Apollo 8 was was going around the moon and not landing, to understand the voyage. Um, so I think that you're going to have to have Mars simulation missions around the moon, above the Earth's Van Allen belts, which protect uh, the space station from radiation. Uh, so you have to have simulation missions of that duration around the moon. And then I think you're going to have to have one trip, practice trip to Mars and back. Um, and then I, when I wrote that, I, I realized that actually a lot of the problems can be solved if you have part of the spacecraft spinning. Because if you have, what, I thought, why subject yourself to the lack of gravity for, 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 for a year, a couple of years, um, and have to deal with it with drugs and exercise and, and increasingly lose the battle? If you had a bit of the spaceship that was spinning that you could sleep in, just sleep in, for eight hours a day, that provided you with a third or half of Earth's gravity, that might actually do a great deal for them. So I do think that when we go to Mars, part of the spaceship will be spinning, which, mm. is, which is, for me, a science fiction fan, is, is great. Yeah, so I was about to ask you that. So you do speculate on the kind of engineering aspects of what a yeah a, a, an interplanetary transport yeah, system would look yeah, like. Because because the transit craft is is vitally important. You know, the people are going to live there um, for a couple of years. They, I mean, look at, look at. The, there's been experiments done, in, in, particularly in Russia, of locking people up for that duration of the Mars flight. Yeah. And most of them have not gone well. Mm. <laughs> They've been at each other's throats, but, you know, very early on. And, and so, so you've got the mixture of the crew, the isolation of the crew. And, and if you can um, design the spacecraft so obviously makes things easier, much easier. A non-rotating spacecraft, easy to design. A rotating spacecraft or a rotating section, much harder to design. But the benefits are, are really good. And as you said, radiation, it has to have protection against radiation as well. So um, it's not just a case of um, slinging a few um, Orion modules together uh, with a living module behind it. It's got to, It's going to be... You know, very different from that because, as you say, it's it's the voyage that's the final frontier, not getting to Mars itself, not being at Mars. So, do, yeah, I mean, do you do you speculate uh, like the, the the sort of different approaches, like the the Zubrin approach, the Mars Direct, or 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 the NASA? What was the what was the ridiculous NASA? Uh, approach that was well not ridiculous but but the fact that no one really bought it when about you know four four years ago when they had the kind of uh yeah. passage to how they were going to how they were going to do it um yeah did, it's, there's, there's gonna have to be a, um a lot of research because it's difficult to sit here 25 20 25 years earlier and say the mars craft is going to be like this you can only talk about the factors which will influence uh, the Mars craft and understanding more about the human body is going to to influence that. But you're quite right; there are various ways to get to Mars. Um, some of which, if you can cope with problems of duration, you can perhaps take a um, least energy approach to Mars and, and travel with a Holman transfer. Um, if not, then um, you're going to. Some people suggest going via Venus, giving, give, getting a gravitational kick from Venus. So instead of just slowly moving out in the solar system, you dive in and go across it, across mm. the inner solar system, and pop out to Mars. That's a possibility. Um, it may well be that we have better propulsion than chemical rockets. You know, nuclear electric is one is one um, propulsion system that may be much better in twenty years' time than than it theoretically it could. But it's, it's not very good today. Uh, not for large craft at least. So it may well be that if you have a better propulsion system, the voyage is, is less. For instance, if you could get to Mars and back in six months, that changes so much because not only is the effect on the human body less in six months, but then you can start throwing things away. You don't need a completely closed life support system. 
Um, you don't need to recycle everything. You can take your food and throw it away um, and, 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 be, and not be as stringent on having to make it completely self-contained because you could take sandwiches, you know, you didn't have to <laughs> anything like that, you know. So, yeah, so there are also, when I was writing about the, um, the trip to Mars and also the establishment of the moon base, uh, how you would dig and 3D print um, structures on the moon, uh, you've got to be aware that you're looking from now. And for instance, um, a few years ago, if somebody talked about putting a base on the moon, they would think about these huge aluminium cylinders you'd make on Earth and you'd fit them out, and then you'd take them to the moon and you'd put them on the surface and you'd cover them with soil for radiation protection and the astronauts would move in. Um, no, no, 3D printers are the way to go. You send a 3D printer uh, to the moon, a huge a huge robot arm, uh, and the robot arm will then make the structures. It will take the lunar soil. It will process it in some way to make it into a paste, and then it will squirt the paste using a, a robot arm into an igloo-like structure. I mean, Japan can already make a house by putting the components on one side, putting a robot arm in the middle, uh, and then pressing a button. And this robot arm will then mark out the boundaries, pick up the bits, put them in the right place, and assemble the house. And that 3D printing technique on the moon will save an awful lot of um, bulk being sent from the Earth up to make a moon base. And yet, 20 years ago, we didn't really think about that. So there's going to be things over the next 20 years which will change change the game. So you've got to, you can only give a sort of reasonable expectation, uh, sometimes allowing that it might be able to get, it, get to Mars and moon faster. Uh, we might be better at uh, controlling our bodies at reaction to radiation, et cetera. Um, so that I was aware that the ultimate story actually could rest on a few big discoveries changing the game. Uh, but that made the writing fun, you know, that mm. made the writing quite fun. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's exactly what I was going to say. When you when you were writing and researching and, and, and sort of doing this as a sort of thought experiment, was there any kind of particular revelation that you had where you thought, oh, yeah, I, I'd never really thought about that and maybe that's the way that it will go? Well, yes, I, I think that I think the, the key to getting to Mars, and indeed if we want to send humans further than Mars, which I, uh, we won't do in the next 50 years, I don't think, is, is perhaps altering our DNA expression. Uh, is, and it's perhaps changing the way, because our genes could, um, are able to repair radiation damage. Uh, and if we could amplify that, um, then that would obviously help humans on Mars, because it's the radiation damage which is going to be tremendously harmful for them, particularly, you know, if if they get to Mars and, and they're already suffering. I mean, I have this scenario whereby, uh, I won't give the give the, the um, shock in the middle away, but the scenario where the crew of a Mars transit vehicle are being monitored by their own AI system and back on Earth, and their performance scores are going down and down and down because they're fatigued, you know, they're suffering medically. And what do you do about that? So... Understanding our body and protecting ourselves medically and genetically might be a, a, a game changer. But, but there were sections in the book which didn't depend on that. One great bit of fun I had was uh, imagining being on Mars in 2069. How many people would there be? And what would their relationship be back to Earth? Because I had this idea that because the voyage is so strenuous, uh, and dangerous, we'll lose people on the way to Mars, um, that some people, when they get there, just might want to stay. Mm. They, they'll just stay there, and they will be buried on Mars eventually. And they could not face, psychologically or physically, the return home. And I thought, what does that do to the mentality of the, of the, of the Mars base when people really become Martians? Um, and I had great fun with you know looking back on Earth and realizing it was no longer their home. It was their origin. And then I went a bit further and said, okay, well, when is the first baby going to be born in space, on the moon, on Mars? And how will that affect the colony when there is somebody growing up on Mars, Faye, um, who was um, never on Earth, Mars is their life, and for whom Mars is their home? How would, what loyalty or relationship would they have back to Mother Earth? Because 
that's not their home planet. And so that, that provided a lot of interesting psychology, particularly towards the end, end of the book, as to, as to how our attitude would change. Like in a small uh, analog, you know, when people went to the new world mm. you know, and set up colonies there, um, they uh, very often did so because they resented the government back, uh, back here in England uh, and elsewhere and set up their own type of government, their own philosophy. And so I thought that eventually there will be a philosophy of Mars. Yeah, I, it, it's really interesting. And, and I think that that also, what is interesting is is how, when you look at sci- science fiction writing and they and they place society in, in a kind of future scenario, it's amazing how even, say, over my lifetime, the way that we envisage that is continually changing. You only have to yeah, watch early exactly. uh, early Star Trek or yeah. mid Star Trek or later Star Trek to see how just in it just in in my lifetime that that whole vision of of where we are psychologically. And then you think, gosh, yeah, trying to transplant that into a new world and trying to work out how psychologically we might be there is is tremendously difficult. That's right. Also, also when you're at the frontier. Uh, I, I, I wondered a lot about this. It didn't, not so much got in the book, but perhaps it'll get in somewhere else. Is that America was built on the principle of the frontier, mm. and the frontier is a is a big part of their culture, um, and and it's everywhere. Um, but Mars would be the ultimate frontier. I don't see us going and living on Jupiter or Saturn because of the duration of the voyages and the radiation. So how would this more difficult, this distant frontier affect, um, say, the United States, which on the Earth has a culture which needs the frontier, but there are no new frontiers on the Earth for them. So this would be this would this would this would be a very interesting scenario to think about how America would regard the Mars colony, and how the Mars colony would regard practically everybody back on Earth. Uh, and I saw a divergence. I saw, uh, in my 50 years, the Mars colony is not independent because there's nothing on Mars you mm. can eat. You know, you have to, every calorie you eat, every breath you take has to be measured, manufactured, or taken there. Um, so Mar- the Mars colony in 2069 is dependent on supply from the Earth. But suppose there comes a time when it isn't. Uh, suppose the time when it can be self-sufficient even at a very crude level that's a, that is a that is a sort of big psychological change in the history of our species that um we have humanity which is not part of the earth that would be amazing so you've done these two books are you going to attempt a book which is the the next 50 years so we get uh you, you know you should be a publisher you, you, <laughs> next hundred like, years <laughs> <laughs> you hit the nail on the head um you know space 2500 or something mm. as the 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 story between the first base on mars you know eking a living out barely surviving uh and what that would be in 500 or a thousand years time i suspect the, the, if i did that it would be um 20 20 um 30 69 or something like that mm. um i don't know um, it's certainly tempting, and it certainly it would certainly be fascinating to do that. But I decided the next book actually it's not going to be about stars and planets. I wanted to write and not about planets. It's going to be about stars and galaxies, because um, I, I sort of in the books I've written they've all been fairly solar system oriented. I've done the Moon biography, the Sun biography. I've done a biography of Galileo. I've done one on astronauts. I've done Journey to the Centre of the Earth. Apollo 11 and now Space 2069. They're all round here. <laughs> They're all in this area. But, so but, but you're that, an astrophysicist, right, by, by John yeah, Paul Bank. Yeah. <laughs> I got my PhD from studying uh, nearby stars. Yeah. And also um, the funny stars outside in around our galaxy. So, yes, so I wasn't, although I've been fascinated by the moon for so long, it's a part of me. I actually got my PhD from stellar astrophysics. Mm. So I, th- I thought, I wanted to, I wanted to sort of write something which showed people the scale of the universe, uh, the the time of the universe, and somehow our place within it. 
I know, I know, I know. There's so many people who said things like that, and there's so many books which say, you know, they, they come out, you know, very often this was with the universe in a book, you know, the greatest story ever told, or our cosmic habitat, or something. You know, you, you get a lot of them, and some of them are great. But I just thought, well, perhaps from what I've learned about writing these two story-led books, I might be able to write a, a sort of slightly different story-led book about um, galaxies and the universe. So that's the current project, um, and we'll see how it goes. Oh, well. Because to me, to me, it is the writing. I'll tell you, tell you this, that um, actually when it comes to writing a book about space, um, anybody can get the, the, the facts right. It's just a question of homework. Hmm. You know, you get you get the facts and the history. It's a question of reading and talking to people, and you get the facts right. The thing which is great fun for me, uh, and which marks a book out which is readable, is the style of writing. It's the narrative. It's how you play with the timeline. It's how you introduce characters and how make chapters rise and fall. That for me is the is the most fascinating part of it. And uh, but it also drives you completely up the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, that's what I really enjoyed about Apollo Eleven. I thought you absolutely nail that that well, kind. ebb and flow of information and and interest. Well, thank you. There's a, there's a saying which which says that uh, if uh, people don't have to read your book, <laughs> uh, if, if, people, if, people, if people don't want to buy it, nothing will stop them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, but yeah, I definitely, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm super looking forward to that. So I've got, I've, I've got a couple of frivolous questions to, uh, on, to, to finish, for, to finish up with because I've, I've dragged your Sunday far too long now. Um, uh, if you had a, a superhero from the past, a kind of someone that you really looked up to, who would you bring back and show them where we're at now in terms of? in terms of where we're at with our understanding of space or our space exploration, et cetera? Almost any great astronomer, you know, wouldn't it be great to sit down Hubble or Humerson or Herschel uh, or any other astronomer beginning with H? <laughs> <laughs> is, um, that, is that a prerequisite? <laughs> <laughs> and just say, this is where we're at. You know, um, you know, we understand the universe is, is like this. Um, um, and and just watch the watch Einstein's mind um, turn to jelly when you said you know the way you thought the universe it's yeah it's mostly your way but there are bits around the edges which are nothing like what you ever ever conceived um, so it's hard to think of one particular person um, and I, I, out of my to general life I'd like to have taken a few writers and composers um, and told them about where we've been. Um, but you know, there's so many scientists um, that I look back on. Uh, Rutherford is a particular hero of mine. He was at the same university much earlier, obviously, than me, and he was a remarkable chap. Uh, obviously, instrumental in understanding the atom. Um, and Fred Hoyle, uh, I, I, I met many times, um, mm-hmm. and when he um, didn't agree with the Big Bang theory. Um, so yes, but. Thinking about it, you know, as I'm trying to answer it, it might even be somebody like Carl Sagan. You know, Carl died in 1996, a long time ago now. And and yet all the big major he died at a time when cosmology in particular was had been static for decades. Nothing much had happened. But after he died, very soon after he died, we found out that the universe was not only was accelerating, yeah. <laughs> and that that was totally unexpected. Yeah, and so he would have been amazed at that. He would have been amazed at the exoplanets we found around other stars, and he would have been amazed about the current big hot topic in physics called entanglement, mm. which is totally weird, totally weird. And if it's true, it changes our, our views of, of the whole universe and our understanding of quantum mechanics and general relativity. So you know, it would be nice to take take somebody like Carl and say, you know, since then this um but i just say every time you read about a, a famous scientist or astronomer you know you'd like to essentially spend ten, you know who, who <laughs> wouldn't like to spend half an hour 
with Galileo. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I totally agree. I mean, it, it's funny. Every time I do a, a space hero of the week or something like that, and I start reading about them and you go, oh, no, this is ridiculous. Eddington's one that I had no yeah. idea just <laughs> just how important he was. <laughs> Yeah, I'd, uh, yeah, yeah, that, exactly. I'd, yeah, yeah, but and Hoyle, yeah, I mean, uh, well, amazing to have met Hoyle. Crap, wow, I'm very jealous of that. <laughs> oh, he was, he was, uh, he wasn't, he was, he was, he was a very nice chap, very generous. Um, and he, when I was at Manchester University, he was a professor at the university, and actually a lot of students joined because Hoyle was a professor. Well, they didn't tell you that he was only around two or three times a year. <laughs> oh yeah, well, classic, classic university ploy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I've got my second frivolous question then, which is, uh, uh, in, in the course of this uh, interview, have you managed to think of a space song to add to our sp- uh, well, space song playlist? Well, I think like you, I'm, I'm into prog, um, <laughs> definitely. And, you know, um, you know, I think of Rush, Cygnus X1, mm. Dark Side of the Moon, you know. I mean, Dark Side of the Moon, who, who on earth? I mean, if you had to take... A, Three or four works of art from the 20th century and say, this is the 20th century. Dark Side of the Moon would be there. It's just, every time I listen to that. But also, I've got spacey writing writing music, mm. um, which is mostly Tangerine Dream. Because there's something about Phaedra uh, and some of the other early Virgin records that they made, which not only when you have it on in the background when you're writing, it shields everything away. It sort of blocks off disturbances. But it's got this spacey, distant, distant feel about it, which actually does help. Um, Jean-Michel Jarre's also good at that, but he's a bit more up tempo and a bit more, you know, jiggly around than um, <laughs> you know, Tangerine, Tangerine Dream. So when anybody, when I've got sitting in my study and I've got Tangerine Dream, I'm like, they all know to leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. So um, yeah, I might, I might. I love I, Tangerine Dream. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you know I might try Tangerine Dream as my as my writing music. I'm, I'm still yet to find a, a music that, that that assists me writing. I, I I'm, I'm I just want to listen. I end up just wanting to listen to the music. Yeah, you're quite right. You're quite right because I had the, I had this idea that you you spend your life writing. It's a great chance to listen to music. Wonderful chance. You listen to music all day, but if the music's too much there. If you listen to sort of opera or, or something, that's too much there. It does distract, it just take your mind a little bit off the focus. And you want some music which you know is there, but is not going to, oh, uh, you're not going to sort of realise you spent 10 minutes listening to it. Yeah. yeah. So give me give me a give me a tangerine dream track that 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 we. Oh, can... my favourite tangerine dream track is uh, is Phaedra. Right, it's going you know, on. When I, when I listen, to, somehow when, there's a there's a there's a bit in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, whereby um, I think it's Zephrod's on a distant planet, um, and he looks at the scenery and it's rubbish. Mm. You do remember this, the scene, you know. He said, I want to look at the scenery, man. He said, have you seen the scenery? <laughs> oh, and, oh, never mind. Uh, but, but some of the background music in that, the, the sort of sweeping chords in the back of that, reminds me of Phaedra. Um, and so, you know, when, you listen, when I listen to Phaedra, uh, and it, it sort of reminds me of Star Wars and Death Stars and when they're flying through a Death Star and an and alien landscape. And I, know this, I know that all this is pretty fanciful imaginary stuff mm. but but for a writer the important thing is putting yourself in the zone isn't it mm. you've got to be in the zone and if this helps get you in the zone um to write good words then great do it and i find phaedra particularly although i just put tangerine dream on let it go um does help um and now <laughs> you can interpret this music any way you want but it does help you get fo- me focus in the zone of, of when I want to actually get some good words out. Well, it's a it's a, not, it's, a it's a good. T- I'm I'm going I'm to give it a go. But it, go, it definitely goes on the playlist. <laughs> well, thanks <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much for for spending your Sunday morning with me. Always a pleasure to to talk to you. You're very welcome, Matt. Thank you very much. The Interplanetary Podcast is 
Alive! I'm going to ask you a question. Go ahead. People have enjoyed the podcast. Where should they go? I think that if you enjoy this podcast, you should think about going to interplanetary.org.uk. That's exactly where they should go. And if if they like it even more than just casually, they could pop over to patreon.com forward slash interplanetary and become part of the journey. Oh, what a lovely group of, of spot cats. We're all spodificus here on the Discord, where I get lots and lots of very, very, very great suggestions for the show, as well as support. And without that, it would not be possible. So I must thank we the love spot cats at all opportunity. Um, yes, <laughs> def- absolutely. So uh, that's it. What have you got planned for this? Um, uh, well, poor old, poor old Chris. What's what's your uh, what's what's your position right now, Chris? Well, poor old me. I'm actually in quarantine in uh, Norway. Uh, we we had to uh, do a ten day stint when we came back from the UK. Uh, so I'm currently in the family cabin in the mountains. It's it's just awful. <laughs> Um, <laughs> no, it's actually, you know, we, we, we've got a few more days left and then we're heading back to Oslo, where I will be when you next speak to me. Excellent. Well, that is most brilliant. I'm yes. still in Devon here in the, in the, in the Devonian period right here. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the Devonian years. <laughs> so yes, I'm uh, looking forward to having a lovely weekend just relaxing with my feet up. Yes. And thinking of about all the different things we can do with the podcast. So, um um I'm going to I'm going to go and let the podcasts go. It's been a very red planet orientated episode. My favorite type. Although no, we, we should we should we should go back to Venus next week. Yeah, we could. We do a whole other episode on that. Just to just to annoy just to annoy Mars. Just get, just keep flip flopping until he finds until he finds until yeah, it's until finally, finally resolved. Get that smoking what's, gun. What's better, Venus yeah. or Mars? Well, I'm uh, I'm gonna uh, <laughs> rename myself uh, Chris Extremophile hashtag Carney. Just so you know. Oh, nice. I'm gonna rename myself Matt. Halophile Russell. Nice. I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And we can fight Don't to the death. Don't give me no perchlorates. <laughs> I'm going to go. I've, I, I'm, I'm glad I learned about Francois Arago, though. Yeah, oh, me too. What a great thing. I can't believe he's a president as well. Fantastic. We need more scientists as presidents, as far as I'm concerned. We definitely need more people like Francois Arago as presidents. What a garçon. What a guy. <laughs> what an arm on that note. Bye bye, smoke. Bye, smoke, guys. Bye, smoke, guys. Bye, 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 bye,